coming on the air with a sliver of hope in Mariupol after aid workers finally got some innocent people out of that steel plant that's faced heavy fire from Russia. But with further efforts stalled, those folks are asking what's next. We're live on the ground in Ukraine with that, plus the EU's new potential ban on Russian oil. Then millions of Americans are in the path of extreme weather tonight. Wildfires in the West, tornadoes in the heartland. We'll have the full forecast to break down who needs to watch out. Also tonight, a major blow to the Amazon labor union after a defeat in the election at a second facility on Staten Island. The new reaction we're getting from the man some call the future of organized labor. Plus, voting's just getting started in the midterm season. Why tomorrow's Republican Senate primary in Ohio matters so much to finding out how much influence former President Trump still has. And America's pediatricians are worried that black kids are getting overlooked and undertreated. We'll explain what the group that oversees these doctors is now doing to stop race-based medicine later in the show. Hey, I'm Gabe Gutierrez in for Halley. And we're starting tonight in Ukraine with a rare sign of progress after weeks of trying to get innocent people out of Mariupol. Our NBC News team on the ground is getting video of people just arriving today in Zaporizhia, about 140 miles northwest of the besieged port city, with help from the UN and the Red Cross. You're seeing families embracing now that they're finally in a safer area. Some cars are apparently labeled with the Russian word for children is a sign not to attack. This from the Ukrainian military shows the reality they've faced for the past few weeks, finally escaping from that Mariupol steel plant. And we're seeing more support from around the world as we're just learning what the European Union is preparing a Russian oil embargo as early as this week. From the U.S., the country's embassy in Ukraine is putting a timeline on its return to Kyiv by the end of this month. And next week, First Lady Jill Biden will be in Romania and Slovakia for Mother's Day to meet with Ukrainian refugees, after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi did so with a group of Democrats over the weekend. Just as new polling shows Americans are even more supportive of Ukraine, nearly 8 in 10 think the U.S. should give more humanitarian aid. Two-thirds want to increase sanctions, and it's all peachy as long as the U.S. military stays out of it. Just one in five want that. Let's get to Cal Perry in Kiev. And so, Cal, are the Mariupol evacuations going any more smoothly, and when can we expect the next round? Well, I certainly think the Ukrainian government wants to have another round immediately. That's obvious. You have at least 100,000 civilians in and around the city of Mariupol. We don't know exactly how many are in that steel works plant. We think it's hundreds, maybe a few thousand. The latest numbers we heard were about 600 civilians injured in and around that plant, um, as well as 600 soldiers. Uh, but this latest batch of folks to get out, as you said, some making it to Zaporizhia, others still on their way, but telling harrowing stories of what's actually happening in that city, many of them uh, talking to our colleague Matt Bradley today, and that's where uh, this video came from. You have stories um, of children going out, gathering rainwater uh, to drink, and then coming under shelling, people tapping their radiators for water, just the humanitarian conditions, uh, really hard to understand. But when you have a month of fierce fighting in and around it, that's sort of what happens. The Russians have, have wrung this city. Um, they're starving people in that city, and they are at times, according to the Ukrainian government, indiscriminately shelling people in that city. The International Red Cross and the United Nations were part and behind really the organization for this evacuation. This was a priority for the U.S. Secretary General, who was here just a couple days ago. Um, and it seems as though at least we've had our first successful evacuation of those civilians, though uh, there is no ceasefire in place. In fact, Gabe, um, a commander of the Ukrainian military saying that after that most recent batch of 100 civilians made it out, Russians started shelling again uh, that steelworks plant. You know, it's so disheartening to hear that, uh, Cal. And, you know, it's so heartbreaking to keep seeing those images coming out of Zaporizhia. I know you've been there for a while, and just, you know, several weeks ago I was there as well, and we kept seeing those images out of Zaporizhia. At that time, several weeks ago, many of these refugees were continuing to the western part of the country, places like Lviv. Now that Kyiv is relatively safe, or safer, where you are, where are those refugees heading? Are some going to Kyiv? Are so many still trying to get out of the country altogether? 
Some people are trying to get out of the country. Um, some people have been sort of um, stranded in and around Mariupol trying to ride out that, that horrendous siege and will try to leave the country. But as you said, uh, some people coming here to the capital um, and trying to stay here, though the situation here has changed really in the last week. We had a cruise missile strike about 72 hours ago, and after that, the mayor here in Kyiv told people not to return to their homes. And keep in mind, Gabe, as you know, 7.7 .7 million people internally displaced. The United Nations saying about 15 percent of them are now on the move to try to return home. It's a difficult position that the government is in. They, of course, want to facilitate people returning to their homes. There's not any sort of ground combat here in the capital region anymore. Uh, but those threat of airstrikes seem very, very real. And I think the government is concerned that people are going to return home. And also, we should say, Gabe, um, you know, people return home oftentimes to nothing, to rubble, to no power, mm. um, to no belongings at all. And it's hard for the government to sustain that as well. Um, so I think that's a concern that the government has. And Count President Zelensky is warning civilians that they could end up getting deported into Russia. Now, we've been hearing about those so-called filtration camps for a while yeah. now, but do we have any better handle on how common this actually is, how many people are getting deported to Russia, and what are the conditions in these, in these camps? We're, we're still trying to estimate based on what the Ukrainian government is telling us. And it's happening, obviously, more in these frontline cities. In Mariupol, for example, uh, we're hearing citizens say uh, they're returning to their homes, there are Russian units there, and then people are being separ uh, forcibly separated, uh, some people being sent across the border to Russia, again, uh, to these camps. We're relying on the Ukrainian government. Um, we haven't independently verified these reports, but this is certainly something that they're telling us. The other thing that is happening, and we're hearing this from eyewitnesses and from the government, um, is that Russian troops in these cities will oftentimes use civilians to do much of the cleanup, and they'll threaten them with deportation to Russia. If they don't clean up the streets, for example, they'll say, we could send you across the border. Again, these are anecdotal eyewitness reports, nothing we've been able to confirm. We, we can't reach uh, Mariupol, but it is in keeping with what we've been hearing from the government and what we've been seeing in the video from this city. Cal Perry and Kiev. Cal, thank you so much for your reporting. Let's go now to Josh Letterman on that news that the EU is close to banning Russian oil. And Josh, why is the EU deciding now's the time for this Russian oil embargo, so to speak? Is, is Germany now on board? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, a lot of the countries in the EU, like Poland, have been pretty gung-ho about doing something like this for a while, but they really couldn't move forward while you still had major countries, major economies like Germany's uh, totally opposed, Germany uh, being the largest buyer in Europe of Russian oil. Uh, but now the Germans have had a change in tone. They are no longer objecting to this Russian oil embargo, and in fact, they are now saying they think they could completely wean themselves off of this oil by late summer. So just in, within a, a few months. So we are expecting, according to uh, one U.S. diplomat in Europe, as well as an EU diplomat, uh, that an agreement could come uh, as soon as later this week, likely to have mm. some important caveats, such as a phased-in approach uh, that would allow for this to take place uh, over time, possibly some exceptions for other holdouts like Slovakia and Hungary, uh, who weren't completely on board with this and had to sort of be coaxed along by the Europeans. So they may have some carve-outs that allow them, at least for a short time, to be able to buy uh, some limited amounts uh, of Russian oil so that the European Union could get an agreement, move forward on something the Ukrainians, as you well know, have been saying they want to see as a sign that Europe is really cranking up the pressure on Russia and President Putin. So stand by for news on that later this week, right? And you're also hearing that this could include more Russian sanctions as well, right? Yeah, that's right. So the Europeans have done five rounds of sanctions as already. And so uh, what we're expecting later this week in concert with that oil embargo is the sixth package of sanctions. Uh, and officials tell NBC News that among the likely targets in that package uh, is the Russian-owned bank Sparebank, based in Moscow, one of the largest banks there. And it had been largely spared from EU sanctions in the past, interestingly, for the exact reason the Europeans were worried that if they sanctioned this bank, it would make it difficult for them to continue to do the energy-related transactions they need to be able to buy Russian oil. Now that they're taking Russian oil off the table, uh, there is some hope that they can uh, further put pressure on Russia and its banking system by applying those sanctions to Sparebank and other entities sometime later in the week. Josh Letterman in Washington. Josh, thank you. Now let's go to some breaking news in, in New York, where Amazon workers have voted not to unionize a second facility on Staten Island. The final vote total at the LDJ5 facility is 380 in favor, 
and 618 opposed, with about 61 percent turnout. It's the warehouse right across the street from the one that unionized last month, and it would have been just the second Amazon facility in the U.S. to organize. The union's leader, Chris Smalls, tweeting out that organizers should be extremely proud to have given their co-workers a right to join a union, and he's urging them not to be discouraged. Meanwhile, Amazon says it's, quote, glad that our team at LDJ5 were able to have their voices heard. The company opposes any union efforts in the U.S., and workers accuse Amazon of engaging in union-busting techniques, like mandating anti-labor classes. By the way, it's coming as Amazon ends a key frontline worker benefit. It won't get paid leave anymore if a test positive for COVID. Antonia Hilton has been following this. She's in Brooklyn right now. And Antonia, I'm hearing you just spoke with union leader Chris Smalls. What's he make of all this? That's right, Gabe. We just talked to him. This is the site where the votes were counted during, well, for a couple hours this afternoon. Chris Smalls arrived a bit after the scene started to calm down here, and he was disappointed, but he also was resolved. He sees this as a really long-term strategy. There was some pressure on him. There was a lot of anticipation behind this vote because, as you mentioned, there was this historic first warehouse to unionize. And I think some of the workers wanted to send a message with a second warehouse to go down like a domino and send Amazon this message that here, all these young people at these warehouses want to have a seat at the table. And that's not what happened here. But he said, you know, hundreds of other locations have reached out to him and want to move forward with the unionization process. So this is still the beginning. Take a listen to some of what he shared with me. I keep expressing that this is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, you're going to win fights, you're going to lose them. Uh, you cannot get discouraged by that. You know, you have to build off the losses, get upset, get mad, get angry. Uh, talk to your coworkers. Stay resilient and stay together. And I promise you, you know, things will change for the better, especially for the workers. Some of the anger that uh, employees and organizers like Chris have been feeling comes from the anti-unionization efforts that you mentioned. And one that many have been talking about on the ground here today is apparently, according to employees, Amazon managers in Staten Island were having relentless one-on-one -on -one meetings with employees and really urging them to vote no. And so there's some talk here today that they may file some claims against Amazon, uh, basically arguing that the company has acted unethically in the process of moving toward this vote. And so really the message from today is while they lost this one vote, the Amazon labor union, this new unionization effort, says they're not stopping this fight, Gabe. So the fight goes on, Antonia. And we're also learning that Amazon is getting a hearing, though, to try and overturn the first election. So is the union worried about that? You know, they say that they're not that worried about that. Uh, one representative lawyer for the ALU told me that the bar to move toward a hearing is very low. That essentially, all Amazon had to do was write up a couple accusations about the behavior of labor organizers and that they could move forward with a hearing. And they say they haven't seen any of Amazon's evidence against them, and they don't think that whatever they have is going to ultimately hold up. So they seem pretty relaxed about this hearing that's expected to happen toward the end of May. But in the event that Amazon has evidence that Amazon labor unionized, uh, union workers had done something unethical or had biased employees in a particular way, that they did something that, and they're able to actually present evidence in that, it could leave to that vote being overturned, which would be a major setback for this movement. But people here on the ground today seem to not really be thinking about that. The pressing matter was how do we lift each other up and move forward with all the other work that they have to do right now. They don't think this hearing is going to be a big deal for them, Gabe. So, Antonio, quickly, I mean, a lot of people were looking at this as sort of, you know, kind of a test case or at least looking to see what would happen in Amazon. Is this really a labor resurgence nationwide or, or not? You know, where, where, where does this go from here? Where does this debate go from here? Well, Chris Smalls, who's become the face of this fight at Amazon, thinks that this is the beginning of a national movement that's not just about Amazon or about Staten Island warehouses. But it's about Apple. It's also about Starbucks. I mean, more than 200 Starbucks locations have filed to move forward with unionization efforts since just last summer. And so he says there's a real movement growing here, a revitalization of the labor movement in the United States. And it's being led by very diverse coalitions of young people uh, who, you know, want a seat at the table and want people like Jeff Bezos to have to listen to them, Gabe. 
Antonio Hilton in Brooklyn. Antonio, thank you. Texas lawmaker Ronnie Johnson telling the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection he will not participate in what he says is the panel's, quote, ruthless crusade against former President Trump and his allies. Congressman jo Jackson is one of three House Republicans who got a letter from the committee today asking for the lawmakers' cooperation. Letters also went out to Arizona Rep Andy Biggs and Alabama Rep Mo Brooks. The panel making detailed requests about why they want these specific people to come talk to them about their role in the January 6th insurrection. The committee says it wants to talk to lawmakers who had meetings at the White House and direct conversations with former President Trump leading up to the Capitol riot. The House Republicans have until May 9th to talk to the panel. The committee is trying to wrap up its fact-finding phase before public hearings start on June 9th. Sahil Kapoor is following this for us. And Sahil, give us some more insight into why the January 6th committee wants to talk to these three lawmakers in particular. That's right, Gabe. Well, let's start with Ronnie Jackson, since you mentioned him first. Uh, he is understood to have been the subject of encrypted text messages by a man named Stuart Rose, the leader of the extreme right group, uh, the Oath Keepers, which is being charged with seditious conspiracy uh, as part of its alleged connection to the violence on January 6th. Specifically, uh, according to the committee, Rhodes texted someone that uh, Jackson needs protection if anyone is inside to cover him. He was looking for uh, someone who could help, saying that Jackson, quote, has critical data to protect, unquote. Now, Jackson, in a statement, said he does not know the individuals who are texting about him, does not know what they're talking about, and made clear he's not going to participate. As for Andy Biggs, uh, he is uh, alleged by the committee to have been involved in the planning in the run-up to January 6th. That was uh, allegedly his idea, in part, to bring protesters to Washington, D.C. He was named by a far-right activist that, as coming up with that idea. He also, uh, again, and according to the committee, worked to persuade state officials that the election was stolen, which we know to be a lie. And finally, he's understood to be linked to a request to then-President Trump for a presidential pardon for all activities linked uh, to January 6th that he could have gotten in trouble for. Why is, was he potentially requesting a pardon? The committee wants him to come in and talk about that. And finally, with Mo Brooks, he recently had a very public and high-profile falling out with Donald Trump after Trump unendorsed him uh, in his Senate primary in Alabama. He's trying to win an open seat there. And uh, Mo Brooks has since then made public statements about his conversations with Trump, where Trump continues to talk about reversing the result of the 2020 election, even after Biden has been in office for quite some time now. And Brooks, according to his telling, uh, has privately made clear to the president that the election is final and can't be reversed now. The committee says to all three of these men, please come in. We'd like to ask you some questions. They're encouraging them to do it on May 9th. Uh, and uh, we've reached out to all three of them. So far, only Jackson has responded. So, Sahil, these are requests for voluntary interviews, as you mentioned, Representative Jackson declining, of course. What's the likelihood that other lawmakers will willingly testify? It's doubtful, to say the least. Uh, uh, Jackson, you, as you mentioned, has made clear he won't uh, participate in this. Others who have been, uh, you know, invited by the committee to voluntarily give an interview and talk to them, including House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, have indicated that they have no plans to comply with this. Jim Jordan is another one who is just sort of running the clock on this request, knowing that Republicans are in good shape to flip the House of Representatives, take the majority uh, this November. And once they do, this committee is going to be out of business. So. So uh, it's doubtful the committee could still subpoena members of Congress, but they've been deeply reluctant to do that. That, that, that you know, could open a, a pretty dark door that could lead to some uh, you know, dangerous places down the road. So right now, it's all voluntary, and right now, not clear who's going to cooperate. Sahil Kapoor on Capitol Hill. Sahil, thank you. And today, a jury in Washington found an ex-NYPD cop guilty of attacking a D.C. police officer during the January 6th riot with a flagpole. 56-year-old Thomas Webster was convicted on all six counts of assault and civil disorder. Webster tried to convince the jury that the D.C. officer started the fight. His attorney arguing Webster showed, quote, restraint. The D.C. officer testified that he struggled to breathe when Webster tackled him and ripped off his gas mask. Webster is the fourth January 6th defendant to face a jury trial and the first to be tried on assault charges. Almost 800 defendants have been charged in connection with the insurrection. And more than 250 have pleaded guilty. A rare move today in Atlanta, where a court opened its doors to cameras because 
of so much interest into the selection of a special grand jury. It's all part of the Fulton County District Attorney's investigation into whether former President Trump tried to flip Georgia's 2020 election results in his favor. The 23 grand jurors plus three alternates were seated today. They will serve for up to a year. It comes as CNN reports on text messages showing an aide to Georgia's Secretary of State trying to end the call in which the former president asked the Secretary of State to find the votes necessary for him to beat Biden in the state. According to CNN, the aide texted President Trump's then chief of staff, Mark Meadows, quote, need to end this call. And I don't think this will be productive much longer before following up with thank you and wow after the call ended. That call, of course, is at the center of the Georgia DA's investigation into former President Trump to determine whether any of his actions or those of his allies were criminal. Blaine Alexander joins me now from Atlanta. And Blaine, let's start with this investigation, which, which has been going on quite a while, as you know. How, do, how strong does the DA believe the case is? And have we heard from former President Trump about it today? Well, Gabe, she's been looking into it now for the better part of a year, but today represents a major step forward. That's because now that this special grand jury has been seated, she has something that is going to certainly be crucial, and that's subpoena power. They don't have the power to approve an indictment, but they do have the power to compel witnesses to come forward and to actually appear and testify under oath. That is key because, of course, at the top of the list of the people they want to hear from is Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, the person who was on the receiving end of that now infamous phone call. So, you know, she's spoken about this case. She says that that she is confident that if the evidence shows that there's enough to bring charges, she's absolutely going to do it. She's somebody who has been fearless in her prosecution before. She went up against Atlanta public schools during the cheating scandal. So she's made it clear that she doesn't care who's on the other end of the charges. If the evidence brings that to bear, she will file those charges. Now, as for whether we've heard from President Trump, not today, but he has spoken out again in the past calling for, quote, the biggest protest you've ever seen in these types of cities, listing Atlanta among them. And that's something that's Cause the DA to actually step up her security game. And Blaine, let's talk about that special grand jury, which took just 90 minutes to be picked today, an hour and a half. What makes it so different from a regular grand jury? A couple of things. One, the fact that they can meet for up to a year, but two, the scope of this. They're not going to be focusing on multiple issues like you might see uh, with a typical grand jury. They're only going to be looking at this specific case, and it's something that's going to, they're going to be investigating this case uh, specifically for up to a year, Gabe. And witnesses won't be called before the special grand jury until June, so why so long, why wait so long if they're already seated? A couple of things. One, the process. It'll take a little while just to kind of get the schedules going, get those subpoenas issued, all of that. So the process stuff will possibly take some weeks. But also because, you know, today is the first day of early voting for Georgia's May 24th primary. So D.A. Willis has said that she doesn't want to start issuing subpoenas until after that primary because of just how the two intertwine. You know, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a top witness, he's also on the ballot for the primary. And of course, also a Secretary of State, he's somebody who has to run the election. So she doesn't wants to interfere in that election in any way, she said. Blaine Alexander in Atlanta. Blaine, thanks so much. The Supreme Court issuing a unanimous ruling against Boston today. The justices say the city violated the Constitution when it refused to let a local organization fly a Christian flag in front of City Hall. One of the flagpoles in front of the building is made available for groups to promote causes and celebrate the city's diversity. For 12 years, the city had approved all 284 requests until the group Camp Constitution asked for the Christian flag to be raised. The group's founder sued, and the city argued flying the Christian flag would amount to an unconstitutional government endorsement of religion. Parts of... Kansas and Oklahoma now under a tornado watch until later this evening. And for some context, May is the most active month when it comes to tornadoes, and we're already seeing it. It's coming on the heels of a pretty wild weekend where Kansas already had this massive tornado. Just look at that video. Packed winds of up to 165 miles an hour and damaged over 1,000 buildings. Four people were hurt, but their injuries were minor, thankfully. And there is more extreme weather out west, where 4 million people are also under wildfire alerts. This is New Mexico, where over 1,000 firefighters are battling the largest active wildfire in the country. Thousands of people have already been evacuated, and authorities are warning of even more windy conditions 
in the coming days. For more on all this, Bill Karens joins me now here in studio. And Bill, we just got this tornado watch a couple hours ago. What should we be, we be on the lookout for tonight? Well, we are concerned with where we're going to see a big tornado and if it's over a farmer's field or if it's going to be through a town. That is the biggest risk that we have going through this evening. We already have this one very strong storm, Tornado Warren Supercell, that's now in Oklahoma, north of Kingsfisher, heading towards Dover and Hennessy. So the tornado sirens are going off in those towns. People are gathering their families. They're going into their shelters or their basements or their bathrooms, and they'll wait for this to go by and go by. There's a lot of storm chasers out here, so we're going to have a lot of lead time to know until the sun sunsets, whether we have tornadoes with these storms or not. But that's just one of the ones that we were watching. Fairview had a very strong storm go through. That was tornado warned. There was a lowering of the clouds, but the funnel did not touch down on the ground. So that was not a confirmed tornado. And as far as our tornado watch goes, this pink box that includes Tulsa, Oklahoma City, just south of Wichita, this goes out until 10 p.m. this evening. So that's the timeline for the chance of tornadoes. And then these storms tonight will race into areas of Missouri and also Arkansas. And there's the areas that have that tornado warning that when I just just showed you to the north of that just some severe thunderstorm warnings. We do expect additional storms to develop south over the next couple hours and it looks like they're just popping up here. These are the ones that will head through Oklahoma City as we go through the next hour or two. And we've even had a lot of heavy snow and rain in areas of Nebraska. Uh, how's that for May? I'll show you some pictures of that in a second. So for tonight, the area of greatest concern, the area in red, a moderate risk of severe weather. We only have one category higher, which is called a high risk of severe storm. That only happens two or three times every spring. We get about this moderate risk during the peak months, April, June, and May, about once every other week. And then tomorrow we take the severe weather threat into areas like Louisville, Lexington, Cincinnati, up to Can, Columbus, Georgia. This will not be a lot of tornadoes tomorrow, but we could see hail and also some gusty winds. And then on Wednesday, we do it all over again in the same area of the country, targeting Oklahoma City to Wichita Falls. Dallas, you're on the edge of that, and Wichita's on the northern edge. And Gabe, I mentioned I'd show you some of those snow pictures. It's pretty incredible. This is scenes today live from Interstate 80 in Kimball, Nebraska. There was enough snow that they actually had to plow the roads this morning, wow. May 2nd. Incredible. Just incredible looking at those pictures. But, you know, also another part of the country on the fire front, New Mexico. So is there any chance it'll let up anytime soon over there? It's been very dry in the southwest, and we've had a lot of big storms come through with gusty winds. And the storm that's causing the tornadoes today is what caused the extreme winds yesterday and so far today in areas of New Mexico. So this map shows us who has the fire weather concerns. So we're under red flag warnings everywhere, obviously, in red here. And under fire weather watch near the Albuquerque area, we've had numerous blazes that have been burning in between Albuquerque and Taos into the east of there. And those have been the ones that have been, you know, firefighters have it. They're in the mountains. It's very dry. The winds have been gusting really high, and they haven't really gotten much contain uh, containment on those. And it's all because of the extreme drought conditions in this area. And it doesn't look like it. So we've pinpoint New Mexico here. This map shows you where it's going to rain over the next week. That next storm misses New Mexico. And it looks like even though as we head towards the upcoming Friday, Saturday period, just sunny, warm and more dry conditions, Gabe. So not much hope out there. A little temperatures, though, in about the middle of May will be cooler, but they need rain desperately, just like all the West. Bill Karen's, you know, tornadoes, snow, wildfires, all in one <laughs> forecast. Busy, busy man. Bill Karen's, thanks so much. Thanks. Now, police are on the hunt tonight for a suspected killer and the Alabama corrections officer. They're corrections officer they now think helped him escape. The Lauderdale County Sheriff said today that a felony arrest warrant is out for Vicki White, a 17-year veteran who had been named Employee of the Year four times. The sheriff says White was sent to retire the very day she disappeared, and investigators are now looking into whether the pair was romantically involved. Everybody thought she was going to retire. You know, nobody saw this coming. As part of the investigation, are you looking into the fact that maybe they did have a romantic? Absolutely. Yeah, that's always a possibility. She was the last person seen with Casey White, a six foot nine inch tall, 260 pound inmate, shown here moments before he vanished Friday. The two are not related. According to investigators, the officer said she was transporting the inmate from jail to the courthouse for a mental health evaluation and planned to go on her own medical appointment after dropping him off. Investigators later found the officer's patrol car abandoned at this shopping center. Casey White was serving time for a crime spree seven years ago that included a home invasion and a carjacking.
In 2020, White was also charged with two counts of capital murder after confessing to stabbing a woman to death in 2015. He later pleaded not guilty. And while a $10,000 reward is being offered for information leading to their capture, people are being warned not to confront Vicki and Casey White. You shouldn't try to approach either one of these individuals. We consider both of them dangerous, and in and, and all probability, both individuals are armed. The U.S. Marshal Service would not speculate on where they may be, but did say Mexico has been alerted about the manhunt. And coming up, the Department of Homeland Security is defending its new board to fight disinformation, what the DHS secretary is saying in response to the backlash. And if you are looking forward to Spirit and JetBlue joining forces, we've got some news for you. Why the big merger deal isn't happening. Tonight, a cleanup effort is underway at the Department of Homeland Security over that new disinformation governance board that Secretary Mayorkas announced last week. Trouble is, he didn't give much detail about what it's supposed to do, so the name alone triggered major backlash from Republicans who are worried it'll be used to censor free speech. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy comparing the concept to the Ministry of Truth from George Orwell's book, 1984. Mayorkas said the board would focus on disinformation coming from Russia ahead of the midterms and misinformation from human smugglers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Mayorkas was pressed for clarity this weekend. Will American citizens be monitored? No. Guarantee what, that. Well, so what we do, we, we in the Department of Homeland Security don't monitor uh, American citizens. You don't, but will we, this board change that? No, no, no. The board does not have any operational authority or capability. So joining me now is national security correspondent Ken Dendelanian. And Ken, you cover this stuff. Did the DHS get over its skis here by announcing the new board before being able to give real specifics on what exactly it does? It certainly seems that way, Gabe, at least in terms of a communication strategy. You know, the agency, as you said, said that this board would focus on countering disinformation from Russia, which has interfered in our elections in the past, and from human smugglers targeting migrants on the U.S.-Mexico border. But officials weren't 100 percent clear on how this board would go about that, leaving a huge opening for critics on the right to suggest a nefarious plot to censor speech. DHS Secretary Mayorkas, as you played there, has said publicly that the administration could have done a better job of explaining what this dif disinformation board will actually do. In fact, he said it will do more of what DHS has been doing for years, tracking disinformation by foreign adversaries and figuring out how best to counter it. He said this board is a small internal working group that does not have operational authority and, as you heard there, will not monitor American citizens' game. And, Ken, then there's the political concern, right? The GOP saying uh, about free speech protections and Elon Musk calling the board, quote, messed up after voicing his own concerns about Twitter labeling tweets with disinformation. Yet Secretary Mayorkas said it would not censor Americans. So does Musk have a point here, though? I think a lot of what people like Musk and what some Republicans have said about this has been hyperbole, frankly, Gabe, because there's no indication that this board will seek to censor Americans, and DHS does have strict rules about that. But I also think it's fair to carefully scrutinize any effort by the government that seeks to put labels on speech. At the same time, we live in a world now where foreign disinformation is thriving on U.S. social media, and officials have said that in some cases that has led to threats of violence and even violence itself. For example, DHS officials have said that Russia and other adversaries have sought to fuel the lie that Donald Trump won the 2020 election as a way of dividing Americans. And DHS says it needs to be on top of that disinformation threat game. Yeah, and Ken, some say it would be better to just pull the plug on this board and instead try to create laws that hold social media companies accountable. But I'm assuming that's easier said than done, right? As you know, uh, Congress is hardly passing anything these days and certainly has not been able to pass many laws that regulate social media. There's a lot of uh, dis disparate interests on many sides of that question. But I think some of the critics here are not quite appreciating how big a problem disinformation has been and how the government is trying to grapple with it. There are no easy answers here, but they are feeling the need to kind of deal with this massive disinformation problem, Gabe. Ken Delaney in our Washington newsroom.
Ken, thanks so much. Well, let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Spirit Airlines has rejected JetBlue's bid to merge, saying it will stick with Frontier's offer to partner instead. Spirit agreed to a deal with Frontier in February. It wasn't until April that JetBlue offered to acquire the airline. Spirit says its merger with Frontier is the way to go because it's better for shareholders. Number two, the European Union is moving forward with its antitrust case against Apple. The EU says Apple pay restrictions are harming competitors by limiting access to technologies allowing contactless payment. Officials are also looking into whether the company is distorting competition for music streaming. Number three, Netflix has canceled Meghan Markle's animated series Pearl amid company cutbacks. Netflix made a deal with the Royals in 2020, including an animated series produced by the Duchess herself. The news comes as Netflix reported a disappointing first quarter. Number four, some Broadway theaters will, will no longer require proof of vaccination. The mask mandates are still in place until the end of this month for all 41 theaters, but vaccination status might differ for some. The league is recommending you check your individual theater for your show for more information. Number five, the year's biggest night in fashion is back. We're talking about the Met Gala. The theme this year is gilded glamour and white tie. In just a few minutes, some of the biggest stars will walk down the red carpet at the Met Museum right here in New York City. Now, some big battles ahead as key states go to the polls for primaries this month. We'll tell you what's at stake in a major swing state tomorrow when we come back. Stay with us. A major pediatrics group wants to remove race-based medical guidance for children. Why, a new policy change could be a heavy lift coming up. But first, the first key test of the Trump factor on the 2022 midterms is set for tomorrow's primary in Ohio. The Senate race is front and center as GOP candidates look to fill the seat of retiring Republican Senator Rob Portman. But it's not the only key battleground on this month's primary calendar. On the 17th, two more big tests for the Trump factor in the Pennsylvania and North Carolina Senate races, with Democrats hoping to flip the seat in both states. And then on the 24th, Georgia, the governor's race. Mr. Trump notably not endorsing current Governor Brian Kemp's re-election bid after he resisted pressure from Trump to overturn the 2020 election. Joining me now is Mark Murray. And Mark, let's start with Ohio, a close race on the Republican side, as we noted. So how do we, things, uh, how do we think things will shake out there? Yeah, Gabe, this race ended up changing uh, after uh, the former president, Donald Trump, ended up endorsing J.D. Vance, the author of the Hillbilly Elegy uh, a book and memoir. Um, and according to a Fox News poll that recently came out, J.D. Vance uh, ended up going to, at 23 percent of Republican primary voters. You ended up having Josh Mandel, who ran for the Senate back in 2012, at 18 percent, then followed by Mike Gibbons, a businessman, at 13 percent. But, Gabe, it's important to note that the J.D. Vance lead, according to that poll, is well within the poll's margin of error. And also, the biggest vote getter is undecided at 25 percent. So there's still a lot of fluidity in this contest, a lot of unpredictability. And we have to see J.D. Vance is probably your slight front runner, but I would emphasize the word slight going into tomorrow. I didn't see J.D. Mandel on that list, though. So in a couple <laughs> of weeks, we have Pennsylvania and North Carolina, two Senate seats being vacated by retiring GOP Senators Pat Toomey and Richard Burr, both places where the Trump endorsement will also be tested. Pennsylvania is considered the Democrats' best chance to take back a seat. So do they have a shot in North Carolina, too? Yeah, and so Democrats looking at the general election, you are exactly right. This is the race that they think they have the best shot of flipping to be able to help retain their Senate majority, Gabe. Um, and on the Republican side, Donald Trump has endorsed Mehmet Oz, a celebrity doctor in this contest. It was a surprise over David McCormick, a hedge fund a millionaire who had actually lined up a lot of people in the former president's uh, orbit. Uh, but there's a recent Monmouth poll, Gabe, that ended up showing that uh, 
uh, Mehmet Oz's favorability ratings are a little bit worse uh, than David McCormick's. And, uh, and again, you probably have to assume that Mehmet Oz is the slight favorite, but again, this race is not a done deal. Certainly very close there. And the Georgia governor's race later this month where Mr. Trump made it his mission after 2020 to unseat current Governor Brian Kemp and is also up for grabs, that secretary of state seat. How well could Trump's pressure campaign work here? Yeah, so Gabe, when we talked about the Trump endorsements, uh, endorsees ended up being the slight favorites in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio. That is not the case uh, when you end up getting to Georgia, where David Perdue, the candidate that Donald Trump has endorsed in the gubernatorial contest, is running significantly behind uh, incumbent Governor Brian Kemp, two to one margin, according to a recent Atlanta Journal Constitution poll. And uh, while I think Donald, Donald Trump certainly isn't giving up on the race, that that is one in which uh, the former president looks to be seriously behind. And it is coming while Purdue has made relitigating the 2020 election his primary focus in this contest uh, uh, against the incumbent governor, Brian Kemp. Mark Murray, our senior political editor. Mark, thanks so much. Still ahead, a top U.S. pediatrics group says it's time to ditch medical guidance based on race. Dr. John Torres breaks down what this could mean for how children are cared for in this country. Plus, an ex-Philadelphia police officer is accused of shooting and killing a 12-year-old boy. The new details we're getting about this case next. Just days before actress Amber Heard takes a stand in a defamation case brought by her ex-husband Johnny Depp, she shook up her PR team. We'll explain a little later, but first, NBC covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what, they're, what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, Tennessee's governor is pausing executions for the rest of the year so the state can review its procedures for lethal injections. This after a testing oversight forced the state to call off the execution of Oscar Smith last month, an hour before he was going to die. According to the governor's office, the review will look into the chemicals used in lethal injections, staffing considerations, and the lethal injection process manual. From our Northeast Bureau, Philadelphia's district attorney's office says an ex-officer accused of shooting and killing a 12-year-old back in March has been charged with murder. New details of the shooting revealed today found that the boy had thrown a gun down about 40 feet and dropped to the ground before he was shot. The former officer surrendered Sunday and has been denied bail. And out of our West Coast Bureau, Yesterday marked the first day of a new program for families struggling to afford childcare in New Mexico. Now the state is waiving the cost of daycare for more than 30,000 families. Families that earning up to 400% of the federal poverty level are eligible. And today the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying they're taking a closer look at all of their guidance in a bid to get rid of quote, race-based medicine. The lead author of this new policy says doctors are concerned that black kids have been undertreated and overlooked and that this new policy is a key step to eliminating racial health disparities. So the academy is going through everything, their guidelines, educational materials, textbooks, and even newsletters. And this overhaul had been in the works but really intensified after the murder of George Floyd. They're now set to change protocols like the unproven theory that Black children face lower risks than white kids for urinary infections. They're also planning to update guidance on newborn jaundice, which currently suggests some races have higher risk for it than others. And Dr. John Torres is here with me now for more on this. And Dr. John, the lead author of this new policy, says that these changes are going to require a heavy lift. So tell us, what do all these changes actually mean for parents? 
So for patients and parents, what it's going to mean is that getting the care you need, getting the attention you need, and possibly getting the medicines and treatments you need. Because up until now, and a couple of things are happening here. One is this has become medical dogma. So this is something I was even taught when I first got into medicine about these race-based calculations and race-based decisions we make. And so changing that dogma is going to be very complicated. On top of that, we know that it's also difficult in some situations to get the data we need to find out exactly how this may or may not affect things. For example, gave the best example example I can give you is Latin is not considered a race. Hispanic is not considered a race. It's considered an ethnicity for some reason. So when it comes to putting down the race you are in different forms, we don't have the opportunity to do that. So that can complicate things. That can confuse the data a little bit. So once we get that more under control, which is going to take this heavy lift, we'll get a better idea of how to handle everybody in every situation, which is what we want to make sure that we do the appropriate care. We do the best care without worrying about these things, Gabe. And Dr. John, let's also talk timing about why we're seeing this now. Just how much did the social justice and civil rights movements that we've seen over the last few years factor into this decision? So you've heard about this starting to take off pre-pandemic, and so this has been something that has been in the works, but it certainly was accelerated over the last couple of years because of a lot of the social situations taking place around the country and around the world, and because of that acceleration, more attention is being paid on it, which means that it'll be happening faster, we'll get more attention to it, and hopefully more understanding of where we need to go here, and that's the most important thing, again, Gabe, is making sure we take care of everybody the way they need to be taken care of. And Dr. John, before I let you go, can we expect to see even more major medical groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics make pledges against race-based medicine like this? Uh, definitely. The American Heart Association already came out and said we need to really look at cardiac care, especially heart failure care for blacks and Latinos, because that's something that we know they don't get the care they need. Other groups as well, they're looking at them saying we need to make sure that when it comes to kidney health, other types of health, that these other groups are jumping on saying we need to look at this again. I think we're going to get a revamping of the whole system and basically a reviewing of everything to make sure that we get it right this time. Dr. John Torres, thanks so much. Coming up, actress Amber Heard has fired her PR team as she gets ready to take the stand in the defamation case brought by her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. The latest from the courtroom, next. And welcome back. NBC News confirming that Amber Heard gave her PR team the boot just a couple of days before she takes the stand in a Virginia courtroom. The actress cut ties with Precision Strategies after being frustrated with the coverage she's gotten over the course of the defamation trial between her and her ex, Johnny Depp. Sources familiar with the situation tell NBC News. Depp took the stand a couple weeks ago and has essentially controlled the narrative of the pair's relationship since then. Depp is suing her for $50 million in damages because of an op-ed she wrote in the Washington Post back in 2018 where she called herself a public figure representing domestic abuse. Depp's legal team says Heard was referring to allegations she made of abuse during their divorce back in 2016, which they say ruined Depp's reputation. Heard is countersuing for $100 million. Now, NBC's Maggie Vespa joins me now. And Maggie, over the course of Johnny Depp's testimony, he's talked about how Heard allegedly picked fights and sometimes slapped, shoved, or threw object at him. And a lot of that seemed to resonate online. So talk to me about how on social media it seems people are rallying behind Depp. Yeah, you nailed it right there. I mean, look no further than social media. Hashtags like justice for Johnny Depp and Johnny Depp is innocent are really picking up major steam. And that there's this change.org petition, too, going past social media, demanding that Amber Heard be cut from her role in upcoming Aquaman 2. More than 3 million people, there it is, have signed that petition. Total hundreds of thousands this past weekend alone. That's not always the uh, court battle, definitely the PR battle. And Depp's team is wrapping up soon, and then Heard's team will take over, with the actress expected to testify Wednesday. Of course, that's going to be a big moment for her legal team to try to move the narrative to their favor, right? Gabe, it's going to be a huge moment. I mean, they're expected to really try and shift the narrative here. And in their opening statements, if that's any preview, and it should be, they promise to paint Depp as a, quote, monster who would drink and use drugs and then physically abuse Heard. Heard, we should note, has denied throughout this abusing Depp, Gabe. Now, Maggie, today in court, we heard from several witnesses, including Depp's security guard, talent right. agent, and an entertainment lawyer. So what were your biggest takeaways from today? 
Yeah, you know, that talent agent's testimony seemed really big. It was tied to issues really at the core of a defamation case, and that's how much damage, quantifiable damage, Heard's 2018 op-ed may have done to Depp's career. And in the wake of that piece, which we should note never directly named Depp, his agent said the actor was dropped from a $22.5 million deal to star in Pirates of the Caribbean 6. And we'll note Disney has never stated that Johnny Depp was dropped because of that op-ed. And we have reached out to Disney today for comment in light of this recent testimony. We haven't yet heard back. Still, that talent agent noting that to this day, Depp can't get cast in any major motion pictures. Gabe. So, Maggie, you know, why do you think that this case has just riveted the country so much? I mean, so many people are paying attention to it. There's that petition uh, that you just mentioned. But, you know, this really seems to have struck a chord. Yeah, it really has. You know, earlier today we talked to uh, a PR executive. She said, you can definitely call me a crisis management expert. She's been doing it about 20 years. And her takeaway was, look, for better or for worse, we're in this age of social media. We're in this age where people are able to comment on things in real time. And we're also in an age, in her opinion, where people want their celebrities, they want their public figures to kind of be stand-up citizens. They want to know about their personal lives, and if they see any kind of black marks on their records, they're going to dive in and comment on it again in social, on, on social media, comment on it publicly, and we can see kind of as opinion builds, and we can see as these consensus, um, a public consensus emerges on any of these issues, and we're able to track that in real time. This, is, this trial's been going on for three weeks. It's incredibly mm -hmm. uh, public. At this point, we're about halfway through, experts believe. Again, Heard's team is set to take over soon, so probably about three mm -hmm. more weeks, they say. Um, and mm -hmm. we asked if they right. think Heard's team can turn the tide. The experts said it's going to be really difficult. That is a long-term game. Maggie Vespa in Los Angeles. Maggie, thanks so much. That's a wrap for this hour. Hallie Jackson will be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.